Welcome to this tutorial on agricultural applications of synthetic aperture radar. My name is Juan Manuel López Sánchez and I am a professor at the University of Alicante in Spain. These are the contents of the presentation. First of all, I will motivate this uh, topic in the introduction and then we will move uh, to different applications of synthetic aperture radar in agriculture. So the first question we may ask is why using remote sensing for ag agriculture? The idea or the answer is that it's a very useful tool for management and especially for the optimization of the resources that are employed in agriculture. In principle, we can find two different groups of end users of this, of this technology. The first group is formed by international, national or regional authorities or agencies who are interested in large-scale products or maps. The second group is interested more in localized or in small-scale uh, inform information and the second group is formed by the farmers or the farm managers. So in fact, the second group is the one that is interested in what is named precision farming. So the type of products uh, these two types of end users are interested range from uh, crop type maps to prediction of the future yield and it also comprises the consumption of water resources. So if you are a, a national agency and you want to and you want to get one of these maps, then you go to these sort of products. If you go if you are a farmer and you want a precision farming product, then what you want is, for instance, timely information of crop, about crop condition or you want the water requirements in order to irrigate only and when it is necessary and so on. But in principle, you are dealing with the same sort of problems. The first of this uh, type of products is a classification. In one case is a crop type mapping, in the second case is the classification among different stages along the cultivation cycle for the same crop type. The second idea, the second product is, a, is since you want to know where to irrigate or you want to control the amount of water, you need to know the soil moisture. So this is a different product. And finally, you are interested in the final productivity of yield prediction either the scale is uh, large or small. So once we have uh, answered why it is useful to use remote sensing for agriculture, we have to ask why using a SAR, why using a, synthet a syn synthetic aperture radar. The first answer is quite obvious. Radar offers you continuous observation. So you can have an, a continuous plan of uh, images that they are acquired during night, during night or day, or also the and which are acquired under uh, every weather condition. Besides that, radar offers you sensitivity to the structure of the scene, so to, to the orientation, shapes, sizes of all the elements in the plants and the soil, and it provides you also sensitivity to the proper to the dielectric properties of the scene, so the water content both in plants and soil. Therefore, it should be useful to provide, uh, to some extent, all these products that we, that we mentioned in the previous slide. So, for instance, it can be possible to distinguish among different crop types, so to provide crop type maps, or to identify different stages of the same crop a long time. So, this is what we are going to call phenology retrieval. And in principle, we should be able also to separate different responses of the different elements in the scene, like vegetation and soil, and then to estimate for each one of them the parameter of interest, like the water in the soil or the water in the plants or the biomass for the vegetation and so on. Finally, we also have to say that, of course, this information is complementary to the one that is provided by uh, optical remote sensing sy systems. So, in fact, it's a good idea to complement or to, to combine both technologies in a final product. In order to give to give an uh, idea of what can be done with the SAR in agriculture, I'm going to show you now an introductory example. Here we have five crop types, uh, two or three parcels for each one of them. This test site uh, is um, located in Indian Head 
in Canada. And in this scene, we have 20 SAR images that were acquired, acquired during three months by the radar sat uh, sensor, the, the Canadian radar sat and it was acquired in 2009 during the AgriSAR 2009 campaign funded by ESA. So in the next slide, I'm showing you composites of this area uh, covered by these fields. These are the RGB composites obtained by combining the polarimetric information using the channels that you see on the top right uh, corner. So the blue is related to, to the addition of HH plus BB, the red to the subtraction of HH minus BB, and the green is the cross polar channel. So here you have from left to right and, top, and from top to bottom, you have the 20 images in this composite form that were acquired during this, during this cultivation cycle for these five, five crop types, five um, cereals in this case. So you can see how, first of all, the different crops present different responses as sometimes. For instance, here you can see how these are distinguished from this and this can distinguish from this and also from this. So the first idea is that different crops exhibit different responses. So, in principle, these images can be used for crop type classification. The second question that can be also clearly seen in these images is that the same crop present different responses a long time. So, what we can say is that it should be also useful for tracking the phenology of the crop, of the crops. So once we have uh, introduced these ideas, let's go to the first application in agriculture of synthetic aperture radar. This first application is um, clearly the most developed and it deals with crop time mapping or classification. So in order to um, perform this classification, we have to check which are the input data we can provide to the system. So the input data in principle should be polarimetric the idea is that we need the information of different channels to differentiate the responses of different uh, crops. If you use only one channel, for instance HH or, for, or just HV, the problem is that there are different uh, types of um, responses that can provide you the same level. But by using the combination of all channels, you are able to distinguish among different classes, among different crop types. The second important thing is to provide temporal evolutions or if you want time series of images. As you have seen in the previous slide, the response change of every crop, of every crop sorry, changes a lot during time. So in fact, the classification will not be as good for some dates as for another dates, as for other dates. And you can also check how this temporal evolution is also useful to distinguish among crops. The third parameter that can be uh, uh, chosen and that can be and that can provide a lot of information is the use of different frequency bands. Crops have different sizes, so for instance, if you use a high frequency uh, system, you will be you will be sensitive to a small or short short crops but maybe you are not sensitive to differences in, in tall crops. But if you use a low frequency system with a higher, a larger wavelength, you will have more penetration and then you will be more sensitive to these large crops. So it's a good idea to have different bands in your system. And in fact, the most effective way to provide a good result is to combine all of these. So this means to combine polarimetric data, data, time series, and multifrequency data. Regarding the algorithms that can be applied for this uh, product, for this uh, application, we have say we, we can say that we, you can use every uh, classifier that is known. So machine learning approaches, superverto machines, ISO data, maximum likelihood decision trees, decision trees. All these approaches work well with this sort of of, uh, of data and for this application. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples 
of this application. In the first case, we have an image that were uh, that was acquired in uh, two bands, L band and C band, over Flevoland in, in the Netherlands by the Airsar Air uh, sensor. We have images. We have only one image at one date. So on the top left, you can see an RGB composite of the of this scene. So you can clearly identify how we have different colors for the different crop types that we have in the scene. This is scene we have three, uh, 13 different crop types. They are represented on the top right on this on this map where you can see all the different elements. So you can see how they uh, correspond clearly to different colors here, to different colors also there. So if you apply a classification algorithm here, you will have a very good result. So this is the result of the classification applied to this image. This is the result. And on the right uh, bottom, you have the comparison between the <coughs> between the reference data and the result. So you can see in green all the valid pixels or the right pixels. And on red, you see the pixels which were classified in a one class. So in this case, we provide we had a good result. In fact, it's an excellent result of 98% of accuracy. Once again, it's a single date, and you have two bands, L and C band. This next example, we saw uh, the final accuracy, the overall accuracy for different results for different experiments. In this case, we had five crop types. Data come from Redarsat 2, so it's it is uh, C band, and they were acquired in uh, Canada. So we have two sorts of car of comparisons. On the left, we can see a comparison on the result that we get when we apply the same classification algorithm to different dates. So as we were expecting from what we saw in the pre in the first slides, the classification is better for some dates than for other dates. The reason is very clear. Some days, for instance, the plants have just been sown or they have or they have been harvested. So in that case, the response is very similar. In other dates, they are fully developed and they have different characteristics, different morphologies, so they are better distinguished. The second uh, comparison that is provided also in this slide is the idea of adding uh, polarimetric variables to the to just the back, the backscattering coefficients. So here you ca you you can see how at different dates we have an improvement that can reach 10% when we increase uh, the observation space and we add polarimetric descriptors and not just the um, backscattering coefficients at the linear channels. In the second year, it was even more evident. You have here data from two years, 2011 and 12. And in 2012, we have even a 20% uh, improvement when we add polar image. Of course, the best results are obtained when we use time series of data. So here you have again a comparison. We have different incidence angles. So this means um, 41 degrees, 27 degrees, 41 and 27 in the same two years, 2011 and 2012. And you can see how when you provide time series, you get accuracies above 90% and sometimes above 95%. So this provides you again the uh, idea of using time series for the classification. Okay, so once we have uh, mentioned, we have described this uh, application, which as I said, are, is very well developed. Let's go now to a, a application that is not uh, that is still under development. This application is, is crop phenology monitoring or estimation of crop phenology. So first of all, I will define what is phenology, and then we will describe the a very basic approach about how to estimate crop phenology. We will apply this to rice and to cereals, and then I will uh, show you also other approaches that can be can be applied in this product. So phenology is a way to is the is the scale that we can use to provide the evolution or the current state of plants as they develop during their life. 
Okay, plants exhibit different features. They start being just seeds and they end up, uh, they go to fully develop plants and they start to have flowers and they, uh, and then the fruit and they are harvested. So all this life cycle can be described by phenology. So the main stages uh, from the biological point of view are the vegetative stage, that is just the growth from seeds to a fully de developed plant, then the reproduction stage in which we have the flowers, and then the maturation stage in which we have the fruit development and then the senescence. So here you can see, for instance, a series of photos over a barley field, and you are going to see how the scene is going to change a long time so the idea is that these different scenes or this scene with these different conditions will provide different um, radar responses so we should be able to distinguish them so once again it's a sort of classification but in this case it's not a classification among crop types it's a classification along the uh, cultivation cycle so in order to provide a uh, uh, convenient way to work with this uh, phenology there are numerical codes that assign a number to each one of the stages so at the end we have a continuous scale that is defined for the whole cycle one of these scales is the BBCH scale in which we distinguish 10 main stages and each one of the 10 main stages can be divided in 10 secondary stages so at the end we have a range between 0 and 19. So the first uh, digit or the tens corresponds to the main stages and the second unit the second or the units correspond to the secondary stages. So for instance if we have a uh, stage 23 this means that we, the main stage is 2 so we are in the tillering or the formation of side suits and the 3 sometimes means that we have 3 tillers. We have 24 is 4 tillers and so on. So this is a way to describe the general evolution of the plants with a numerical scale. So let's start with the analysis of some data. Here we are going to see uh, data acquired over rice fields in Spain, in Sevilla, in, two, in 2009. There is a time series of dual pole terasaric images. And we have uh, data acquired in a ground campaign over six parcels, six fields. So here, for instance, you are, um, we have rep represented the phenology evolution as a function of time. So our x-axis is the day of the, of the year, and the y-axis is the phenology for the different uh, fields. You can see that at some parts of the development, the, the, the growth is very slow so you you have seen that for many dates you have a very slow development of the plants and for other days they are, it is quite steep so you have fast uh, development of the plants so it's something that has to be kept in mind kept in mind these uh, vertical black lines corresponds to the acquirement to the dates in which the terasetics images were acquired so for instance, if we show you some photos of the different stages that we have for these rice fields, here we have the three main stages in which we have divided the vegetative stage into three sub-stages. So we have the early vegetative, the initial tinering and the advanced vegetative, and then the reproductive and the maturation. So for the rice, the early, the early vegetative is when uh, plants have not emerged from the water so they are still seeds or they have started to grow but just beneath the water level initial tillering is just when they emerge so you can see you can start to see here the plants then the advanced vegetative is when, the, is when plants really grow they can reach one meter high they can reach one uh, height of one meter and you can see how they are very vertical and very fresh very green then you, when you go to the reproductive stage, they start to be, you have the flowers, they, just, they start to be more dry, drier, and they start to be not as vertical as they used to be. And then in the maturation, they are really dry, and they are completely random. So you cannot see the vertical structure that you were seeing in the previous stages. So we are going to use also these photographs to explain the 
response that we expect or that we have seen from a radar like uh, like for instance with Terra series data. So here we are representing the backscattering coefficient at HH and BB as a function of the phenology. So we are going to explain now what is what we are seeing at every uh, phenology. For instance, at the very beginning, we can have very low backscatter. This is uh, evidently due to the fact that the fields are flooded. So if they are flat, um, the water acts as a mirror. So the incident energy is, back, is scattered in the specular direction. So the backscatter energy is very low. But if we have wind, the, I, the, what happens here is that we are going to have some surface roughness and in that case there will be some backscatter energy. So we can have even 10 dB more of backscatter signal when we have roughness compared to the case in which we don't have this roughness. The situation changes a lot when, we, when the plants appear. So at this point we have an increase of more than 10 dB at both HH and BB channels. And the reason of that is that we have a double bounce interaction between the stems or tillers and the underground or the flooded ground. So you can see how you have this increase. HH is higher than BB, and this is also predicted by the electromagnetic theory due the, to the two in the interfaces. So the, the water and the, and the plants. So it provides you a higher HH than BB. From this point, when we have the increase in the size of the plants, we may be expecting to have an increase in the backscatter level of both channels. But instead of that, what we have is a decrease. The, um, the reason of that is that for, for rice plants, they are going to grow very dense. They are really packed. So what we have is a very important effect of the attenuation. And in fact, this effect, this extinction, is not the same for the horizontal and for the vertical pol polarization. So we have what we call differential extinction. In this case, the vertical attenuation is much higher than the horizontal attenuation due to the vertical uh, arrangement of all the elements in the plants. So we have here a, a big difference between the two channels. As soon as the plants continue now to the maturation, sorry, to the reproductive stages, plants become, become less vertical, drier, so we are losing this differential extinction, so they are approaching each other, HH and VB, and we increase once again the backscattering coefficient at both channels. And it continues until the end of the maturation stage when we have these dry plants and we have uh, similar backscatter for the two channels. So this is the explanation or the interpretation of what we can see for these rice fields at x band. So in fact we can see that we can differentiate the five stages that we presented in the previous slide with photos and that here are represented with different colors. So they present different responses. So this is the key point to try to invert afterwards the phenology stage from the temporal, sorry, from the ra radar response that we see with this sensor. A convenient way to represent this uh, evolution is using the ratio of HH over VB, expressing uh, dBs. So it's something that has been used in the past for uh, crop type mapping also, sorry, for rice mapping, so for generating maps of uh, rice fields because it's very specific of this crop. So here you can see that the sort of uh, evolution that, that we have. So we start with values that are initially below zero because they are they correspond to surface scattering in, for which BB is higher than HH. Then we have the opposite here, a very steep increase for HH higher than BB due to the a double bounce and then to the extinction and then a progressive descent of this curve until uh, towards the end of the uh, season. So in fact this curve that we have represented here is very similar for instance to the NDVI curve that can be expected for this sort of uh, crop with an optical system. 
of course the reason of the of this curve is completely different in an NDVI uh, for the NDVI for the optical sensor that for radar but you can see that how can you develop a similar similar methodology to uh, track the phenology that we have here if you go to a different band we have also some data from radar sat 2 at C band and here we have represented the same um, ratio in this case computed as an average and a standard de deviation for each field so each field is uh, plotted in a different color but you can see how once again you have values are slightly below zero then you have an increase up to 10 dB or approximately and then we have a decrease at the end so the response is quite similar maybe it's slower the 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 first uh, increase is slower because we are at C-band, so we are less sensitive to the small element, so our, we are, it's like a more progressive response, but the same idea can be also applied to C-band. <clears throat> so we can see also different parameters, not just the backscattering coefficient. So for instance, here we have represented the phase difference between the two copper channels. So this phase difference is expected to be zero at the beginning. We have surface scattering because HH and VV are in phase. Then as soon as we have the double bounce, we have a, a significant jump in the phase difference. And then from this point onwards, we will have a decrease to zero once again. And in fact, for all this area, the phase is more random because we have low correlation between the two, the two channels. If you want to see how can this uh, big jump can be used for the detection of the emergence of the plants, uh, we can see now a, a map of the area. So we are going to see how we can, once again, um, detect this emergence by this phase jump. So at the beginning we have, uh, everything is completely uh, green because we didn't have a uh, phase uh, difference and then as soon as plants emerge we can see clearly he clearly where the rice fields are because they become blue all the parameters that can be used are the very well known uh, polarimetric descriptors entropy and alpha angle in this case we have represented entropy and the dominant alpha so alpha of the first eigenvalue which corresponds to the to the scattering mechanisms mechanism of this first or dominant um, eigenvector so entropy provides you uh, an information about the amount of uh, scattering mechanisms that are present in the resolution cell or in the pixels and alpha provides information about which is this scattering mechanism that we have in the in the cell or in the pixel so you can see uh, like uh, four different areas you have two different areas with high entropy this high entropy here is at the tilling stage and this is due to the uh, combination of two different mechanisms the the surface scattering due to the roughness on, in the flooded areas and to the double bounds we have also high entropy at the end because the plants are like random volume so uh, polarimetry is not going to provide you a lot of information not going to provide you much information and you have also you have also these two areas with low entropy at the very beginning where you only have surface scattering and in the advanced vegetative phase when you have a, a linearly polarized backscatter due to the extinction of the vertical channel this is also confirmed by the alpha angle first we have alpha close to zero surface scattering then here in the advanced vegetative we have 45 degrees this means linearly polarized backscatter and here in the tillering state we have high alphas due to the double bounce so this this provides you a physical interpretation of which what we have seen before with the backscattering coefficients so let's go to the inversion or to the final application of this so the idea is that we can use uh, in this case two decision planes or you want four variables that can be used to distinguish the different stages that we have in the plants along the cultivation cycle here we are representing these two two planes on the left we have entropy and alpha angle and on the right we have the phase difference between hh and vb and the coherence between hh and vb 
and based on this we have and um, we have represented in these two planes we have represented the position occupied by the different parcels and they are represented in colors which correspond once again to the five phenological stages that we saw before so we can see how some of them can be distinguished very easily for instance here the green is well separated from the rest or here the dark blue and here the the, the red so we can decide some thresholds here or build a, a tree to um, classify the um, the crops <clears throat> to classify sorry the stages of these uh, right rice fields this very this is this is the idea of this uh, basic approach and we are going to apply this on a single date basis so this means that we are going to have one image and without any other any other a priori information we will provide a, a cl sorry um an stage as an output so for instance when we apply this to one uh, parcel these are the results that we provide for 11 dates different dates here you can see how all the pixels are classified more or less smoothly so they are they have uh, constant evolution in phenology and you can see also some details for instance here you can see how some parts of the fields have uh, already the plants emerge here so they are in the second stage where whereas other parts of the fields have not this emergence in the plants yet and in fact you move to the next uh, date the the parts in which it was already developed to tillery now they are in the advanced vegetative and in this part that were the light now we have uh, the tillering so we can see how we can follow this evolution and we can even get some details uh, inside the the fields so this is the basic idea of this basic approach of retrieving phenology by using uh, by exploiting the polarimetric data of course we have an influence of the incidence angle so here we have represented uh, two different planes of data of the descriptors and they are for 22 degrees of incidence angle 30 degrees which was the one we used in the previous examples and 40 degrees on the top we have hh and vv the two backscattering coefficients and on the bottom once again we have entropy and alpha one so in fact this is this one is the one we saw in the previous slides so we can see how the responses are quite similar or the trends are quite similar but the values are not the same so it's something that has to be taken into account when developing this application for instance here we can see how the alpha angle does not go beyond 40 degrees uh, when you are in a very steep incidence like 22 degrees but you reach 45 and even more when you go to more oblique incidence angles so this is due of course to the more important contribution from the ground when you are in a steep incidence anyway you can apply also this uh, classification with this very basic approach so we apply this for the three different incidence angle in this case using a decision tree that was built uh, by training with a 50 percent of the pixel were used by training and 50 percent for validation and we found we obtain total accuracies uh, beyond 90 percent for each one of the individual incidence angles we were using in this case four intervals uh, because we merged the reproductive and the maturation because they were very hard to distinguish in any way in in any case if you merge all the incidence angles all the data in the same set you will also have a very good results so in principle the incidence angle is not uh, an issue for this application so you have just a loss of two to four percent in the total accuracy just to mention here that we use as uh, inputs for the classification the two backscattering coefficients the correlation between the channels and the field difference so this is just the polarimetric information without any processing it's just the entries of the c c matrix so I may say that the that the main lim lim limitation of this uh, approach is that we are discretizing 
a continuous a variable which is phenology. So this is a problem because we are putting borders, thresholds here, and plants evolve in a more sub subtle way. So an error in one stage for us, uh, for instance, from 17 to 18, for us is a big error. And if you use a continuous scale, it will be just a small error of just one stage, not one interval. <clears throat> we also apply this algorithm to serials. So here we have results applied over the radar sat to data that we saw in the first slides in Indian head. At the left, we have the evolution of the backscatter level at the cross polar channel and also at the second Paul, a Pauli channel, HH minus VB. And on the right, we have the dominant alpha angle. So you can see how we can use these two parameters to distinguish uh, different um, uh, crop stages. Because, for instance, we only have very, very high values in the cross polar at the end. So this can be distinguished from the rest. And we have also here like a linear increase in the early stages, then we have saturation. But for these first stages, we have a linear increase in the dominant alpha angle. I have to mention also that this data uh, correspond to different incidence angles, which are represented by different colors. So by using this information that I just uh, mentioned and using once again the same approach, we can provide uh, several thresholds here and build a decision tree. So for instance, for this decision, decision tree, we check whether alpha one is below or above this threshold, 20 degrees. If we are above this, we are in this second stage and we have to di distinguish this part from this, which is done by using the level in the second poly channel or in the cross polar channel. And if we were below 20 degrees, we can distinguish the first from the second stages by using a second threshold in the same. Uh, parameter. We apply this once again to the same data set. Here you have the maps that we got for the three barley fields that we have in the area. And, on, and here on the bottom we have the um, percentage of pixels that were classified in each one of the stages. Okay. And here we have represented in the main in the color the the mode of the most representative uh, percentage and we see how we have in this case a 100 uh, percent accuracy with respect to the ground truth so of course it's not a perfect approach but it can provide you a good way to to resolve the phenology of the of the fields in a broad scale of four or five intervals as i mentioned before Phenology is a continuum magnitude, so it should not be discretized. So in fact, we are going to, uh, to mention now, to describe now, more advanced approaches. In this case, we are going to regard agricultural crops as dynamical systems. So these dynamical systems, these plants, have an inner evolution. And what we can provide with remote sensing are observations of this dynamic system. So... This can be used in a framework which is provided by the dynamical system theory in which, which, in which we, we can generate an evolution model for the crops. And we can then combine this model that is going to provide us predictions of the evolution with the observations provided every time we have a new acquisition inside image. So in order to combine both the model and the observations, we can use a filtering like the one provided by Kalman, an extended Kalman filter or a particle filtering. This framework is especially useful when, we, when you want to integrate data from different sensors. So for instance, you can fuse data from SAR, from optical systems, and also from temperature, meteorological data, etc. <clears throat> so here you have a first example. This is uh, obtained with the same data that we use at the beginning. So these are uh, this is obtained over rice, over the same rice fields in 2009 with Terrasar X data acquired X band. So the model starts by defining the main um, 
components using a, a principal component, component analysis. So here you have the model that was and um, generated for these uh, rice fields. So this is the evolution in 3D when these three coordinates, these three axes are uh, or corresponds to the main components that were obtained. Yeah. So you can see now how we have a continuous ev ev evolution of the phenology in this in this um, uh, space. So every time we have a new acquisition, we can combine the um, phenology predicted by the model with the one predicted by the observation, and this is done using a Kalman filter or a particle filter. Here, for instance, we have the retrieve phenology for the whole test site, not only for the six parcels, and we can see how they evolve uh, in a smooth way as we were expecting. Results are much better, so you can go to this reference also to see which are the, the accuracy provided by this methodology. This was also applied to the barley field, so once again, this is the 3D model for the barley field with the real set to data, and these are the evolutions obtain uh, for each pixel in this uh, in this case using all the serials not as the barley <clears throat> so this is for the phenology retrieval finally as we mentioned in the introduction we have also sensitivity to the water content in the elements because we have sensitivity with the radar to the dielectric constants of the elements in the scene so one application, one possible ap application of that is the soil moisture retrieval with the aim of knowing the requirements that we have for irrigation, for instance. So if we have a bare surface, it is known that the power of the radar echo depends on the soil moisture and roughness of the uh, of this surface. So we can say that the backscattering coefficient is a function of the soil moisture and the roughness. So what we have to do is to apply some electromagnetic model to separate the dependence on the soil moisture and the roughness and then invert the soil moisture from the data. However, when we have the presence of vegetation, like in agricultural crops, we have a mixed response from the soil and the plants. We have the response from the soil that is attenuated by the plants. We have the response from the plants themselves. And we have also the interaction, like double bounds, between the soil and the plant, so it's much more compli com complicated than for bare surfaces. In fact, what we have to do is try to separate the um, response from each two parts, from the soil and from the plants. This has been approached by using the composition theorems, using or es exploiting polarimetric data, and it, it is partially solved, not completely, and we have to say that it's also a good idea to use a low frequency because we, for low frequency, like L-band, you have more penetration, so you are less sensitive to the vegetation and more sensitive to the ground, to the soil, which is what you want to measure. So just as, as an example, here we have the retrieved moisture compared to the measured moisture by using a probe. For different crop types, these are five different crop types, sorry, six different crop types. And they were acquired at L band with the ESAR sensor, the yeah, airborne sensor, during the AgriSAR 2006 campaign that were that was financed by by ESA. So you can see which the, which are the errors errors that were obtained for this uh, campaign with this methodology. There is always a problem with the incidence angle. There is an influence of the incidence angle, but for some up applications it provides a good result sorry finally the last application uh, regarding quantitative parameter retrieval that we want to show in this um, slide in this tutorial is the retrieval of the vegetation height using polarimetric side interferometry so in this case we're using the same data set as in the previous case so it's agrifar 2006 so they were acquired at L-band over different uh, fields. And here you have the, re the height that was retrieved for these uh, fields. It was retrieved for rape, corn, wheat, and barley. 
on the left you have the representation of the complex coherences for this uh, for two of the crop types grape and corn which were the ones that provided better results the idea is that the coherences should be well separated in this plane they are expected to form like a line okay a sort of line here and of course here we obtain better results for grape than for corn and they were better even than for the other crop types fields but in principle you should be able to apply this the main li limitation of these techniques is that you have you need to have a large baseline because you need to have a um, good sensitivity to the vertical structure of the plants and you need to have a single pass system an interferometric system with a single pass acquisition because you need to avoid temporal decorrelation which is the main problem when you are dealing with uh, evolving crops evolving vegetation like for agricultural crops <clears throat> finally I wanted to show you some or example on a possible application that uh, radar that radar has in this uh, field in this topic which is the, 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 the detection of cultivation problems here you have a part of some rice fields uh, this is an RGB composite obtained with Terracer X images once again at a single date and you can see that at this field there is an area with an heterogeneous backscatter if you obtain the temporal evolution of this field and compare it for instance for the HH over BB ratio with the other fields you can see how this field is the one represented in red was delayed with respect to the others so we asked to the rice farmers and they answered that for this particular field there was a problem with the salinity in the water so there was an area in the field which is the area we have marked here in red that was not uh, that evolved in a delayed way so at the beginning when all the rest of the parcel was uh, merged at this area it was not emerged yet okay so it's uh, a demonstration of the usefulness of this sort of system with high resolution for some precision farming applications <clears throat> well that's all uh, as you can see there are many applications that are still under development so here you can see a bibliography review in these two slides in the first slide you have for instance some reviews of agricultural application <clears throat> then some papers on classification papers on phenology papers on soil moisture and on vegetation height these are the references i have been using along this uh, tutorial finally i would like to acknowledge the contribution of the agencies special agencies isa the canadian space agency and the dlr for providing the data we have used for this presentation Thank you very much.